Good evening, ghoulies and ghosties and long-leggedy beasties. This is Alex, coming at you from the underworld, and welcome back to another episode of... This weekend, I'm reviewing the splatterpunk cult classic The Black Farm by Elias Withrow. Now, before I get started, I would like to note that I had seen this book floating around in a few online horror book groups, and since the concept sounded pretty cool, I downloaded it onto my e-reader. But from there, it ended up going into my never-ending TBR pile, and I was like, I'll get to it when I get to it. However, fate decided otherwise, because as I had mentioned in my book review video for Dark Hollow by Brian Keane, there's a tradition that my good online friend Brandy and I do, where when our birthdays come around, we do what's known as a birthday buddy read. So, as her birthday was approaching, she gathered up a reader's group and decided that we were going to read The Black Farm. Well, as this was happening, one of my other good online friends by the name of Blake Kelly had contacted me and recommended that I read this book. So, it was pretty inevitable I was about to read The Black Farm. Also, even though I had a pretty good idea of what to expect with this book, I didn't realize it was an extreme horror novel. Which, as I've said before, I have no problems with extreme novels. But what surprised me more than the guts and gore was the author's ability to world build and his creativity. As a matter of fact, his imagination was so kick-ass, it exceeded my expectations big time. But, anywho, without me rambling on anymore, I would just like to say happy belated birthday to Brandy, and I had a great time reading this book with you and the people that you had gathered in that reader's group. Also, I would like to say thank you to Blake Kelly for recommending this book, and if either of you are watching, I hope you enjoy this review. So, without further ado, let's head off to the Black Farm and see what happens when you feed the pig. Unfortunately, I don't have a print copy of The Black Farm, but it is available in print and ebook, so getting your hands on a copy is not hard to do. Now, The Black Farm by Elias Withrow introduces Nick and his girlfriend Jess, and early on, we discover that they've suffered a miscarriage, Nick's father has died, Jess has a sister who's been diagnosed with cancer, Nick loses his job, they get evicted, and Jess has fallen into a deep depression where she has lost all motivation. Then, after gaining this backstory, we discover that they don't believe in an afterlife and they have decided to commit suicide where they no longer have to suffer. However, after they overdose, Nick wakes up in this nightmarish underworld called the Black Farm and Jess is nowhere to be seen. From here, Nick meets the sinister character named Danny, who explains that God created the Black Farm as a common ground for suicides because God and the devil couldn't figure out what to do with these lost souls. And in this domain, everything is ran by this monstrous renegade pig who wants to create an evil world that mirrors God's creation. Then, after Nick discovers that Jess is also on the Black Farm, he dedicates himself to finding her so they can leave together. And even though finding Jess is a hard thing to do, we eventually discover that leaving the Black Farm is painfully difficult, although it can be done. The Black Farm by Elias Withrow was published in 2017, and it was inspired by a short story that Withrow had previously written called Feed the Pig, which was created for the No Sleep Forum. In an interview conducted by No Sleep Interviews, Withrow noted he is inspired by many things, but music, specifically metal, helps with his inspiration. Also, he held Stephen King and Brett Easton Ellis as huge inspirations for his work. Fun facts! Here's a few things that you might not know about Elias Withrow. In the author's bio, it revealed that Withrow had started writing at 15, and although he experimented with different genres, he became attracted to writing dark fiction. 
Also, Withrow first began his writing career by contributing a creepypasta called Horse 8mm, and due to its popular response, this was a turning point that encouraged him to continue contributing to the horror genre. Now that we have that covered, it's time to move on to the spoiler segment, which, if you haven't read this book before, I'm about to reveal some things that could ruin the experience for you. So if you would like to click away, all you have to do is scroll down to the comment section and you'll see that I have a pinned comment at the top. If you were to click the timestamp within that comment, it will direct you away from the spoilers and bring you to the thoughts section. Now, you only have 17 seconds to do this, so ready, set, go! Since everyone's had the opportunity to click away, I would like to talk about a few moments that I will never be able to forget. Now, the first one that comes to mind regards this morbidly obese monstrosity named Muck, which this character lives in a mountain base beyond what is known as the Needle Fields. And for those of you who don't know what the Needle Fields are, they are literally nothing more than these huge fields that are full of large needles where people get impelled on them. And even though this sounds pretty gruesome, the worst has yet to happen because as Nick and his comrade Megan are trying to sneak around, Muck ends up abducting them and brings them back to his lair where he subjects them to very horrific moments of rape, dismemberment, and cannibalism. And while this is going on, he ends up transforming Nick into something that doesn't even seem like it's human anymore. Where by the time Muck is finished, Nick has had his eyelids removed, his arms removed, and his legs bound in barbed wire. Also, since Nick is too weak to eat the human flesh that Muck has brought him, Muck has removed all of Nick's teeth and replaced them with screws so he can eat the meat a lot easier, even though, of course, this causes Nick more pain every time he tries to chew. Then, after that, Muck ends up just dragging Nick around like he's some old plaything until Nick finally has the opportunity to kill himself and be reborn elsewhere on the Black Farm. So, for lack of a better word, this moment fucked me up. Which, I've said this time and time again, body horror really gets to me. But every time it's presented, I honestly can't look away. And in this case, it really got under my skin to see how Nick went from being this handsome guy into becoming this nightmarish thing with the slave mentality. But despite how grotesque this became, I honestly couldn't quit reading because I was invested in Nick's character and I was morbidly curious to see exactly how extreme this would get. The next moment I would like to talk about regards what went down at the Temple of the Pig which the Temple of the Pig was created by a cult of all-male suicides who call themselves the Hooves of the Pig. Then, after we gain some of their backstory, we discover that not only do they worship the pig, but they have a goal to create an offspring in the pig's image, which they attempt to do this by having pig-born rape the women that they had abducted. So, Nick discovers Jess had been abducted by the hooves, and he decides that he's going to try to save her by posing as someone who wants to be recruited into the cult. From here, he ends up meeting this morbidly obese cannibal named Ryder, who is the leader of the cult. And he does get initiated into the cult by being baptized in pig's vomit. Then, after that, he's able to actually sneak off to the basement, and he discovers that, yes, Jess is in fact next in line to be raped by Pigborn. But to save her, he ends up running back to Ryder's room, and he sets Ryder and the temple on fire. Then, as everything is burning down, he's able to kick some ass, save Jess, and get the hell out of there. Now, this moment was really intense because Nick went balls to the wall batshit crazy in order to save Jess. 
Also, I absolutely love how it feels like he put a good screw to this creepy-ass temple, because since it was inside of a mountain, it had no other choice but to burn. And even though the hooves that died there will be reborn elsewhere on the Black Farm, it'll take them all a hot minute to rebuild due to the amount of damage that Nick caused. So, in this regards, I was really pleased on how Nick was able to create this level of chaos. The final moment I would like to talk about was when Nick and Jess fed the pig. So, aside from Nick wanting to find Jess, his overall goal was for him and Jess to leave the Black Farm together, which we earlier discovered the only way that they could do this was if they sacrificed themselves to the pig, where the pig would eat them, then determine if they were worthy enough to return to Earth or go directly to Hell. Well, prior to feeding the pig, Nick decided to visit what was known as the Eyes, which the Eyes were these two men where one had been an angel and the other one had been a demon. However, their angelic and demonic powers had been stripped from them, and they had been placed atop the Black Farm so they could oversee everything. And as Nick is speaking to the Eyes, he discovers that the Eye that was an angel cannot go to hell, and vice versa. So after catching them off guard, he kills the eyes and he eats the one that had been an angel, which this guarantees that he's not going to go to hell when he feeds the pig. And to also guarantee that Jess won't go to hell, when he finds her, he ends up regurgitating the dead body into her mouth, then he makes her swallow. Then, after they are all good and ready to be eaten by the pig, it goes into fine detail about how they enter this monstrous pig's mouth and how it eats them alive, which is not fast and painless whatsoever. So, from the moment when Nick regurgitated into Jess's mouth, I remained completely disgusted until they actually arrived home. Also, because of the author's description, I felt like I was actually inside the mouth of the pig with our protagonist. And even though it was guaranteed at this point that Nick and Jess were not going to go to hell, I couldn't relax until they were actually home safe and sound. So, because of how intense this was and how everything was just so disturbing and original, this is an ending I will not be able to forget about for quite some time. I would like to take this opportunity to bitch about Nick because even though he saved Jess and he redeemed himself in this sense, there was still something about him that made me think he remained a turd dumpling. Also, when he resorted to eating one of the eyes to guarantee that he and Jess wouldn't go to hell, I was torn because a part of me was like, okay, old dude did what he needed to to guarantee that he and Jess would return to Earth, so kudos to him. But at the same time, I was like, what in the hell is Nick hiding up his raggedy ass sleeve that could prevent him from pass and go and collecting $200? I mean, my God, feeding the pig gives you a 50-50 shot of either going back to Earth or going to hell. So, dude, what are you hiding? Now, I understand that some of y'all might be like, Alex, why are you being so hard on Nick? He went to hell and back to save Jess. Well, yeah. Yeah, he did. But at the same time, I know you should never trust a fart, especially when this asshole was happy that Jess had miscarried because he was afraid a baby was going to steal his thunder. Then when she said that she was going to kill herself, instead of him getting her the help she needed, he decided to kill himself with her because he didn't want to be alone. And granted, when they return to Earth, they start a family and live happily ever after and all that jazz. But I'm like, what kind of a self-absorbed dipshit do you have to be to do the things that Nick did? I mean, my God, if he loved Jess the way that he claimed he did, he would have at least gotten her help. And while she was getting the help she needed, he would have taken his trifling ass to a therapist and tried to resolve those abandonment issues. The Black Farm was an extreme splatterpunk book that fit alongside the works of J.F. Gonzalez and Rath James White. 
But aside from this book's guts and gore, the characters were entertaining, the author's world building was phenomenal, and it focused on some pretty hard-hitting subjects, like, for example, it touched on redemption and forgiveness, as well as abandonment issues. Also, above all else, the book felt like it stood as an advocate against suicide. Character-wise, even though Nick was the hero of this story, he was very complex, and at one point after I learned his secrets, I became very disappointed in him. However, I still rooted for him and hoped for his redemption. But after losing my trust in him, I was never able to regain that trust, so for the remainder of the book, I stayed on the fence. And after I finished my read, I still had some pros and cons in regards to Nick. However, this doesn't mean he was a bad character. Instead, this simply means the author knows how to create layered characters. Also, Nick is where the whole subject of abandonment issues come into play, which I touched on this in the Tea Time segment, so I won't revisit it here, but I will say that because of Nick's selfishness and his abandonment issues, these were two of the contributing factors that sent him and Jess to the Black Farm, which, had he sought out some therapeutic help for himself and Jess, they possibly could have avoided a lot of torment. Aside from Nick, I really did admire Jess because even though she was written to be the sensitive and emotional character who couldn't cope, I really feel like she became emotionally strong and she had a heart of gold. Which, I say this because in life, even though she couldn't deal with the hardships that were thrown her way, her forgiving Nick really made me consider what I would do if I were in her shoes. And truth be it, I'm not certain I would be able to forgive someone as easily as what she did if they confessed to me what Nick had confessed to her. So maybe I need to do some soul searching in that regards. But overall, just forgiving Nick felt very genuine and it was something that did touch me. Which, even though Nick is a badass and he does redeem himself, I ended up liking Jess a lot more than Nick because she just seemed like she was a pure character. Then, as far as redemption is concerned, I can't elaborate too much on this subject without giving away spoilers, but I can say that Nick did go to the extreme to save Jess, and he did have redeemable elements. But because of me becoming so disappointed in him, I honestly couldn't reinvest that trust in his character. Which, because of this, everything he did made me question his motive. Like, was he actually trying to save Jess primarily for her well-being, or was he doing it for themselves, or did he finally bite the bullet and do what had to be done because he didn't want to be alone? So, the main question is, did Nick truly redeem himself 100%? If not, maybe this was why he did what I mentioned in the Tea Time segment. Also, I noticed where the Black Farm stood as a strong advocate against suicide, which, as a suicide survivor, I appreciate any work that doesn't promote killing yourself. Now, in regards to the realistic side of this book, we see how if a person ignores their mental health issues, these issues can snowball until something tragic happens. Then, when we get to the fantasy elements of the book, which take place on the Black Farm, I believe that the author was trying to use this world to scare people into not committing suicide, similar to how the Exorcist was used to try to turn people to God. Aside from character and topic, the description and world building of this book was phenomenal. Which, among the elements that stood out to me, I would have to include the farm where Danny resided, as well as Muck's home, and the Temple of the Pig. Which, by how these locations were described, they literally felt like a nightmare come true. However, what impressed me the most were the insane concepts of the needle fields, the keepers, and how the suicides bled through the lacerations of the sky. Which, truth be it, because of how Withrow uses his description and world building, I honestly believe this puts his imagination on par with Clive Barker. Overall, Black Farm didn't scare me or creep me out, but it was a totally original story that provided me with quite a few gross-out sequences. 
Also, because of the author's writing style and how well I was able to become invested in his story and characters, there were times that I could not put this book down. The Black Farm by Elias Withrow is a balls-to-the-wall gore fest, and even though it does have its fair share of blood, guts, and brutality, I was actually able to become quickly sucked into the story due to its characters and originality. Plus, I'm not gonna lie, my morbid curiosity was satisfied, so that was a contributing factor as well. Now, at the end of the day, if you are a gore hound who is looking for a paranormal splatterpunk book that'll make your toes curl, I do highly recommend The Black Farm. On to the questions. Well, actually, this time, I only just have one question, and that simply is, what is a horror book you would recommend that takes place in a hellish dimension? Load up the comments. Before I close out, I would just like to say thank you to a new follower of mine by the name of Chris, which Chris is an artist, and if you would like to check out his work, I have included a link to his Instagram in the description section of this video, so be sure to check that out. But he had actually mailed me. Check that out. That is a coffin nail. I mean, look, the end of it is so cool because it's not circular, it's like flat. So yeah, I just absolutely love that. And I had received it on Friday the 13th, which, oddly enough, a coffin nail is supposed to bring you luck. And I really do believe it because this was the best Friday the 13th I had had in many, many moons. So yeah, I'm going to consider this to be my lucky coffin nail, and it's going to go with me wherever I go. So thank you for that, Chris. Also, he sent me a book called Sarah by J.T. Leroy. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to read this right away, even though I would love to. I just have a TBR pile that I need to knock out before the year is up. But yes, this is totally going into next year's TBR pile. And he also sent me this really cool print by J.T. Leroy. I love the quote there. Awesome quote. And he loaded me up with some pretty cool uh, postcards and everything. So, yeah, just morbidly awesome. Just absolutely cool. And he also sent me some stickers and stuff, which I'm going to put on my book rack. And let's see. I wanted to make sure I had that one the right side up. But, yeah, I absolutely love that little happy package, Chris. Thank you so very much. And I really do appreciate you reaching out to me, and I look forward to talking to you again. Well, now that it's time to close out the episode, I would like to say thank you to Lisa G, as well as J.L. Mulvihill, which J.L. Mulvihill is a young adult steampunk fantasy author, and her books are available in print, ebook, and audio wherever books are sold. Also, I would like to say thank you to Melody Romeo, which Melody Romeo writes historic fiction, and her books are available in print and ebook wherever books are sold. Also, Melody Romeo goes under the pseudonym Adele Lane, which Adele Lane writes same sex fiction, and her books are available in print and ebook wherever books are sold. Also, I would like to say thank you to Nicholas Gray, which Nicholas Gray is a horror author whose books are available in print, ebook, and audio wherever books are sold. Also, I would like to say thank you to Lisa Shin, which Lisa Shin is an artist, and you can check out her artwork on the Facebook page called The Art of Shin. Also, I would like to thank horror enthusiast Blake Kelly, and last but not least, I would like to thank my mom and grandma. And if you're wondering why I'm giving a shout out to these wonderful people, it's because they've had the opportunity to contribute to my Patreon account. And if you would like to contribute as well, I have a link available in the description section of this episode, where all you have to do is click that Patreon link, and you'll see that I have two tiers available. One of those is for $5 a month, which I'll give you a shout out at the end of my videos, and if you have a specific title you would like for me to tie to your name, just let me know and I'll tie it to your name. Also, the $10 tier that I have not only gives you that shout out, but I do creepy photography on the side, so I will send you over a creepy photo at the beginning of every month. After you receive that, just print it off, do whatever you want. 
So if you can do that, that's awesome. If not, no sweat. I just hope you return to this channel so we can have a good time together. And if you would like to hunt me down on social media, links to my Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok are all in the description section of this episode. And if you have not subscribed, be sure to subscribe to this channel and click that notifications button because I have more book reviews coming in the near future. So until we see each other again, I hope you have a great week and sweet nightmares.